<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is the Apostate Prophet. Uh, how's everybody doing? I uh, hope everybody's having a fantastic day. So this time I have a different uh, outfit to wear here because uh, since last time I uh, turned up with uh, with a Jewish talent, I thought this time I should um, I should put on something on to be fair toward the of the Palestinians. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. I just needed to wipe my nose and I couldn't find uh, tissues around here. <laughs> Excuse me for that. All right. Uh, <clears throat> how's everybody doing? Hope everybody is having a fantastic day. Um, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to look through some things that I recently noticed uh, that some people sent me and asked me to talk about. They said, "Oh, this is so good. You have to talk about this. This is so good, man. This is like the best thing you have to talk about." So I thought, "Okay, yeah, why not? Why not? Let's just do it." Um, and that is uh, Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro. Uh, Many, most people call him Ben Shapiro, which is actually wrong. In America, we call him Ben Shapiro. Uh, ben, I'm just kidding. Ben Shapiro uh, had a um, an appearance with UCLA students where he um, was very, very harsh. And I think it actually ended in a massacre. He literally killed people there uh, with his words. And I want to check that out. I want to have a look at that. I want to have a look at that because I think there's a lot of good stuff to review, a lot of good stuff to look at. Um, with that together, I also want to review certain things about uh, Palestine and uh, Israel and all that. However, before we do that, let's let's uh, interact a little bit with the with the jet, with the jet. It was genocide. It, that's that's what I heard. I saw a, I saw a small clip, which is also what I primarily want to review, of uh, Ben Shapiro talking to some weirdo, and um, it was very much a genocide. If there is a genocide ever, that is probably it. That is probably it. That is probably it. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro, you say Shapiro, I say Shapiro, sheep and pirate. That one Jewish girl, AP, there's a rumor Abu Abida is that I hope so. That will be funny. I mean, nobody really cares about him. The, the funny thing about Abu, Abu Abida is uh, that he is the spokesperson of Hamas, but other than that, it's like... Um, I mean, everyone was happy when Yahya Sinwar died. Everyone was happy when uh, Hassan Nasrallah died. If Abu Ubaida dies, it's going to be like, yeah, he's dead, finally. But half the world will be like, who the hell is Abu Ubaida? You know? He's that guy with that, with that mask on who's always speaking for Hamas. And I hope he dies. Uh, that one Jewish girl, Ya Allah. Uh, where is the Mike Winger? Uh, Mike Winger is uh, might join me later for this uh, for the remainder of his live stream to give his opinion on the conflict. Um, yeah, that's what's that's what's going on. That's what's going on. Uh, um, I'm the second half. Same. What happened to Dave? David is uh, apparently babysitting or something. No, he's uh, he said his brother just. Um, came out of prison got parole something i don't know and he has to take care of his of his brother he has to help his brother or something that's that's why that's why that's why good boy good boy good boy um love the shirt ap oh yeah this got just, i just ordered this shirt from some some uh some place actually from judaica web store very very cool place uh alhamdulillah 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 yeah david said he needs to take a break because he uh he keeps going live with me and then the more he goes live with me the more he ends up being uh kind of corrupted and 
he doesn't even uh you know he, I, I apparently I, I make everything worse for him he tries to be a good person and then uh with the way i am and the way i talk and the way i act and the way i think i just turn him into a horrible person so he decided to take a break from me well it makes sense you know that's what i would do <clears throat> let's see by the way ap have you seen the video of yaron avaham who left gaza converted to judaism and served in the idf uh sounds very familiar Pretty sure some people brought it up before. Yaron Avram's journey to what? Gaza mosques to Jerusalem synagogues, a radical Islamist's journey to Judaism. Wow. Pretty, pretty good stuff. We'll check that out. I will check that out. I will check that out. The funny thing is, like, this is what I get. This is the result that I get. This guy here, I guess that's him. Um, Yaron of Yaron Avraham. So he is can provide any hint of his past life, horrible childhood. Yeah, so he is a what? He is a an Arab guy. What is that? A Palestinian guy? Is that it? Is that what we're talking about here? Yes, converted to Judaism. Yeah, that, that's why his name is Abraham. Okay, um, that that's the thing, right? Uh, if, if 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 for for people uh, who are not who don't have Jewish parents, when they convert to Judaism, they are um, known as uh, Ben Abraham or something else. Um, yeah, but so I guess this is him. And the funny thing is, when you look at him, you can't really tell where he is from and what he is. Yes, Arab converted to Jew, went to jihadi school in Gaza as a nine-year-old. Whoa. Yep. So this is, this is the funny thing. They talk about, uh, you know, settlers and, uh, you know, native and not native. The funny thing is when I look at this guy, it's very difficult to tell for me who, uh, if this guy is, is Jewish or like you, could, you could just think that this guy is just born Jewish. You know? <laughs> lots of lots of Mizrahi, Sephardic Jews or even others, Ashkenazi, will look like that. Alhamdulillah. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you, IDF. Thank you, IDF. Arab from Ramallah. Everyone remember to like the stream, converting a serious business. It is very serious business. Uh, unlike Islam, where you just convert and then you're like, they're like, Hey, let me tell you something about Islam, man. Let me tell you something about Islam. Yes, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes totally sense, man. Now just repeat after me. Repeat this phrase after me. I testify that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. All right, fantastic. Now you're a Muslim. Now get the hell out of here. That's basically how Islam is. <laughs> and you don't even have to change. Like You can literally uh, convert to Islam and continue being a serial killer. And they're like, yeah, okay, man. Yeah, with time, you know, he, he will change with time. He will change. Just give him some time. He'll change. We continue raping people. They're like, oh, man, just give him time. He's still new. Like 10 years later, you're still, uh, I don't know, abducting people and uh, and cutting them up. And they're like, come on, guys. Give him some time. He's still a new convert. 20 years later, he's still killing people in the streets. Like, come on, guys, man. He's just, he's just a new convert. He has to learn slowly, slowly, slowly. We have to make it easy for the for him. 30 years later, he's going to the nightclub every day, going to, I don't know, uh, hiring prostitutes every night. They're like, okay, guys, come on, come on. He's still new. He's still learning, learning, guys, learning. Uh, <laughs> that's how uh, Islam treats converts. In Judaism, you have to undergo a serious process if you want to convert. But, yeah, it's different things, you know. All right, um, the Shniko effect. <clears throat> Allah only made the convert appear to be unchanged. Alhamdulillah. Okay, let's see what Thank happens. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm a Christian. I go to Biola University in La Mirada, California. Um, I want to ask you, as an American Jew, sometimes... Sometimes you shouldn't say any, everything that pops <laughs> into your mind because when he said I'm a Christian, I was slightly confused because 
just the way he started speaking. Maybe it's a, just a California thing. Is it just a California thing? No. I, 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 am I the only one who thought, who expected something different instead of Christian? Because maybe it's just, maybe, maybe, this, maybe this is just people, maybe this is just how people talk in California. Like this slightly feminine thing. I don't know. Are all Californians fem gay or something? I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but uh, you know, I was... <laughs> I was slightly confused when he said I'm a Christian. <laughs> Cuz I was very sure that he was that he's um a, a an L, pro LGBTQ leftist guy. But hey, stop judging, man. Look, now we we're, we're doing this pub, we're publicly speculating about this guy because of the way he speaks and uh now he's 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 in the spotlight, and this is this is very disrespectful. Why would you even bring this up? Yeah. Terrible people here in the chat. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm a Christian. I go to Biola University in La Mirada, California. Um, I want to ask you, as an American Jew, how can you continue to condone the actions of the Israeli government, condoned by the U.S. government, in the Gaza Strip, where over forty thousand people have died? including Palestinians and Israelis, in large numbers of children and civilians. How can you continue to condone those actions? Okay, so, okay. Obviously, I want to uh, listen to Ben Shapiro's response because Ben Shapiro is, um, has masterful responses to such things. Just my first thought when looking at this is, what exactly is the point? How can you still condone the killing of so many people? The fact that so many people die, let, let's assume for a second that 40,000 is correct, right? Let's assume that 40,000 people actually died, uh, or let's say it's, it's, uh, it's around 30,000, whatever it is. Let's assume that that is true. That says nothing at all about whether it should continue or not, whether it is uh, worth condemning or condoning. Uh, it says nothing at all about who those people are and so on. It's just, it, it says nothing at all. It's the, it, it, this is very much, um, this sounds like, how can you be, how can you not be for peace? Well, how about we just make peace? That's what it sounds like. It's a stupid point, but whatever. Hold on. I want to I wanna correct you. I don't just condone the actions of the Israeli Defense Force and the Israeli government. I celebrate and loud them. <laughs> Woo. Nice. 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 It is totally based. Very, very nice. Very good. This is why I love Ben Shapiro. <laughs> Very, very big. It is totally big. Uh, I don't even agree with most of Ben Shapiro's worldview and all that, but I just, I love the guy. Always thought he's fantastic. I'm not morally apathetic about what's happening. On October 7th, Hamas launched the most deadly war on Jews since the Holocaust. They killed 1,200 innocent people. They took 250 hostages. A hundred of them are still being held hostage. I know members of families of hostages who are still being held American citizens. Hamas could end this war today by surrendering. They've chosen not to surrender. Instead, they spent billions of dollars building terror tunnels below civilian areas. It is not incumbent on the Israeli government to surrender just because terrorists are evil enough to hide behind civilians. The Israeli government has gone through such extraordinary efforts not to kill civilians that it has managed the best civilian to terrorist kill ratio in the history of urban warfare and it is not close very very nicely put have people respond to this i i wonder if there is actually if there are actually uh people responding reacting to this uh to his response here and critically analyzing that fact checking that whatever you want to call it because what he just said there is absolutely true what he said there is a fact which is why we have somebody like John Spencer, who is an expert on urban warfare, who has also presented his side, his observations on the conflict, and has also said that Israel 
has excelled and done better than anyone else in the history of urban warfare in preventing civilian deaths and uh, doing whatever they can to make it as humane as possible and to keep the 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 ratio of you know com uh, non-combatants versus combatants killed as low as possible and in in a place like gaza this is an extremely difficult thing to do but gaza but uh, israel has done a fantastic job um pretty sure he's also relying uh, on john spencer's uh, an uh, assessment here this is the guy fantastic guy would definitely recommend checking out his his articles on this stuff john spencer israel urban warfare history let me see i have to have i have to i must have saved that somewhere must have saved that somewhere oh you can find it on newsweek you can find it on different sites it's also on uh, west point itself where he where he works but he broke it down very nicely how israel makes every effort to prevent unnecessary civilian deaths and so on civilians will die in a war this is what war is however um israel does their best to minimize the civilian deaths i personally know soldiers who've gone door to door in the gaza strip who have risked their own lives to prevent civilian death israel has complete and utter air superiority over the gaza strip Turns out that Hamas doesn't have an air force. They just had a series of, series of tunnels where they hit all their leadership while their people suffered after their people voted for them. And then they effectively established a dictatorship over the course of the last 20 years. Israel, with their complete air superiority, certainly would have had the ability to commit full scale human atrocities had they wanted to. They have complete air superiority. They could have used F-35s and simply turned the place into a parking lot. They did not, in fact, do that. They moved vast scales of population. In fact, believe it or not, there have been more births in the Gaza Strip since the beginning of this war than there, than there have been deaths in the Gaza Strip from the war itself. That is a very poor way. This is kind of unfair. He's just he's just brutally uh, he's just brutally educating and dropping fact after fact. We have to really go step by step here. The Gaza Strip turns out that Hamas doesn't have an air force. They just had a series of warfare, and it is not close. I personally know soldiers who have gone door to door in the Gaza Strip who have risked their own lives to prevent civilian death. Israel has complete and utter air. Point number one. Israel is, um, there is something very ironic, something very tragic about trying to prevent uh, unnecessary civilian deaths on the opposing side when you uh, conduct war. Um, when Israel has to make sure that uh, that that they prevent unnecessary civilian deaths on the other side, there's something that people need to be aware of. When Israel puts an effort into preventing unnecessary uh, deaths on the other side, then they are risking their own operations. They are risking the lives of their own soldiers, of their own personnel. They are risking the quality and the efficiency of their own uh, operations. They are prolonging uh, the the operations that could be uh, resolved in a in a much uh, quicker way. Israel could just go in and you know bomb whatever they see, shoot and fire at whatever they see. Once they make sure that there are no hostages or anything in this area, they could just they could just level the place. What they do, however, is to is to um, drop sound bombs first, which is like roof knockers to say, "Hey, we're coming." They're basically telling the the, the other side that they are that they are approaching. And this is the this is the benefit that this is what what the IDF does, what the IDF has to do uh, in order to conduct this war. And then later on, be able to demonstrate that they have indeed done everything as required by international law. They have to, they alert the other side that they are coming so that the civilians can get out of their way. The funny thing about that is, uh, yes, you are getting the civilians out of the way. You are getting the civilians out of, out, of, uh, out of harm's way. But at the same time, you are also letting the terrorists know that you are approaching this area now. So there you have already uh, gotten rid of your advantage, you know. Uh, of surprise and then um 
they drop flyers, leaflets, saying these areas will be operated in. This is a safe zone. This is a safe, uh, safe route. Evacuate from here. Go this path, and so on. Uh, they place calls repeatedly. We have on record them uh, the IDF placing calls at homes in in Gaza, telling them to get out, uh, to leave this certain area. The families respond on call, say, hey, hey, we don't want to. We don't want to leave. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stay here and keep my whole family here. Wallahi, I'm going to die here. They say, no, you have to get out. They repeatedly call people who don't even want to leave and so on. So they are getting getting civilians out of the way. Uh making elaborate plans on, on maps where to operate and so on. This is so they, they do all of this because they want to prevent unnecessary civilian deaths. They could just not do this. They could just carpet bomb the entire place. People have so much so many times mentioned carpet bombing. Israel could just carpet bomb the Gaza Strip, right? If Israel was as cruel as they were, it would even they they could brutally bomb the whole place and at some point make people forget that even uh, their own hostages could die in the process. If they were really so messed up and so brutal, on the contrary, Israel has been very, very, very careful, and the the, the response from the other side is still nothing except barbarism. Superiority over the Gaza Strip. Turns out that Hamas doesn't have an air force. They just had a series of, series of tunnels where they hid all their leadership while their people suffered after their people voted for them. And then they effectively established a dictatorship over the course of the last 20 years. Israel, with their complete air superiority, certainly would have had. But hey, they, but, but at least Yaya Sinwar threw a stick at that drone. How can we forget that? He threw a stick at the drone. So <laughs> what does it matter that they hide in tunnels while civilians die upstairs? At least he made a heroic move and he threw a stick at the drone. Now we can all always think about how awesome that was. The ability to commit full-scale human atrocities had they wanted to. They have complete air superiority. They could have used F-35s and simply turned the place into a parking lot. They did not, in fact, do that. They moved vast scales of population. In fact, believe it or not, there have been more births in the Gaza Strip since the beginning of this war than there, than there have been deaths in the Gaza Strip from the war itself. That is a very poor way to conduct a genocide. Yep. So one thing that I have learned since uh, since I started interacting with Jews and going to Israel is that they is that Jews are absolutely terrible at uh, very very inc incredibly incompetent when it comes to genocide. Apparently, they do a ho horrible job <laughs> when they try to commit a genocide. Very very bad. Very very incompetent. Uh, it is true. If we are to assume that the numbers are correct, and there are around the 40,000 deaths or so, the the number of births since the beginning of the war are is already is already much higher than the number of deaths, which would mean that if you if we go uh, a few years further and look back at the population growth of Gaza, we will see that the population still kept growing. You know what that does not look like? That does not look like genocide. That does not look like genocide. That does not look like genocide at all. You know what does look like genocide? This here. This is what genocide looks like. This is what genocide looks like. And this was Rwanda. During the Rwandan genocide, the population is growing and suddenly falls and then grows again. This is what genocide looks like. In Gaza, we will probably not even, we will probably see a little bit of a, of a slowing down of the growth. That's it. That's all we will see. Genocide, yeah. Israel is being more meticulous in the conduct of this war than any army in human history, and certainly than the United States Army in its vast role in the history of, of urban combat. That is, that is uncontested. What, would Israel, what is Israel supposed to do? Simply say that you get to play tag, you take Israeli citizens. That sounds like a very, very, <laughs> that sounds like a very dangerous remark to make in this conservative place which is why they did which which is why people didn't cheer because they're slightly confused but what he's saying is that uh is that israel did an even better job than the u.s in the conduct
of this war than any army in human history and certainly than the United States Army in its vast role in the history of, of urban combat. That is that is uncontested. What would Israel what is Israel supposed to do? Simply say that you get to play tag. You take Israeli citizens. You kill twelve hundred people. You hide behind a baby. You hide behind a civilian. And now Israel has to preemptively surrender. That is a great way to make sure that terrorists always win. What Israel has done ought to be celebrated by the Western world because they've demonstrated that if terrorists decide to launch a war they cannot win, they will be eviscerated from the face of the earth as they ought to be. Exactly. That's how you deal with terrorists. That is what you do to terrorists. That is precisely what you do to terrorists. On October 7th, the terrorist groups and people and individuals, the terrorists stormed Israel, went into homes, started shooting random people inside their homes, took others captive. I mean, just imagine that, man. Just, just think about it. I know it's very difficult for some people who are not uh, Israelis or who are not on the side of Israel to imagine what it must feel like. But just think about it. The terrorists come in. The terrorist comes. He kills lots of people, lots of elderly and others. Then the terrorist comes and snatches your daughter, snatches the, the, the girls, the women, snatches people randomly, abducts them, takes them with them to Gaza, and does all kinds of terrible things to them. Even the United Nations independent report has established that there is uh, that there were multiple cases of sexual assault and sexual abuse by the Hamas terrorists against the Israeli civilians, both on October 7 inside Israel and also later on in uh, Hamas captivity in Gaza. Imagine these terrorists come in, they kill your people, they kill your elderly, execute them on site, take your, take your children, take your women, uh, take your men, rape them, and so on. And you are then simply supposed to say, oh yeah, what, how about, maybe, maybe it's just time to, you know, do ceasefire and stuff. And maybe, it's, maybe, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't fire back. Maybe we shouldn't operate. Maybe we shouldn't conduct airstrikes. Maybe we shouldn't fight against these guys. Maybe we should listen to what they want from us after they have taken our families, after they have abducted our families and killed many of them, after they have committed atrocities like raping people, uh, setting them on fire, tying them up and setting them on fire, tying a mother and a baby together and setting them on fire, tying people to trees and raping them, mutilating them, killing them in the streets in broad daylight. How about, let's just listen to what they want. Let's just not fight them. Right. Who in the world would do that? The only people who object to this kind of stuff, to, who object to Israel's response, are people who have a problem with Israel. If this happened to you, and you didn't respond the way Israel responds, shame on you. Shame on you. Israel has a moral responsibility to respond the way it responds right now. And Israel could go even harsher and even further. Israel is being quite fair and relatively reserved. Noam MKW, AP, I just walked in, but you already sound very Islamophobic. Oh, good. Thank you. I was concerned for a second. I was concerned, but thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Do you not want ceasefire now? I do, do not, not want to ceasefire until Hamas is destroyed and all the hostages are back. I want... And you know how that could happen? It could have happened October 6th. There was a ceasefire on October 6th. And then there wasn't a ceasefire starting on October 7th. And there could have been a ceasefire again on October 8th, even after all of the death. If Hamas had surrendered its top leadership to international justice, if it had released all of its hostages, and if it had turned over its rulership of the Gaza Strip to some sort of decent body that wouldn't have reinstalled terrorism at the top of the food chain. I mean, what, what exactly is the excuse for, Hama, for Hezbollah getting involved in the war? Hezbollah isn't even in Israel. Hezbollah has nothing to do with Israeli territory, and they've been launching 8,000 rockets between October 7th and now. Now it's more like 12,000 or 13,000 rockets, hundreds of them every week. What, what, what is the justification for that? There is only one way to defeat terrorism, and that is to win. You do not win wars with ceasefires. You do not win wars by losing. But uh, this is very unfair because uh, Hezbollah wants to uh, fight and further uh, fire missiles at Jews. So what's the problem? 
you're supposed to all so this is you see how how Jews always th consider themselves superior to everyone you can't you can't even kill them you can't you're not even allowed to kill them you're not even allowed to kill Jews they immediately get offended and want to want to fight back this is because because Jews consider themselves better than everyone else <laughs> In your speech, you mentioned that there are <laughs> This guy sounds angry now. Avengers who like to tear down, and there are lions who like to build. <laughs> In your speech, you mentioned that there are scavengers who like to tear down, and there are lions who like to build up. Are there not some institutions we ought to tear down in society, potentially like the Israeli Defense Force? <laughs> Did this guy just listen to him? <laughs> First off, why is this guy asking multiple questions? But secondly, why does this guy think this question now totally fits into uh, the next point? The guy has just been humiliated. The guy has just been humiliated. He has just been destroyed. He has just been humiliated. He has just been finished. You're finished already. Look at me. Look at me. You know you're done. And then he goes on saying something as stupid as tearing down the IDF. What are you talking about, man? What a stupid thing to say. What an absolutely imbecilic thing to say. What an absolutely imbecilic thing to say. You know what would happen if you tore down the IDF? Holocaust 2.0. What would happen is that the terrorists would take over and they would uh they would they would then start massacring the Jews. If so tearing down the IDF would uh, basically translate to taking away the weapons of the Jews and not away not allowing uh Israelis to defend themselves. This would result in the mass killing of Jews. That's what would happen. And you know that there's there's something very very serious that needs to be that needs to be pointed out. Uh, just just think about how things would unfold if uh, if something as ridiculous as that actually happened, right? It's not it's not going to happen. But let's just think about how it would uh, unfold if in some weird weird world suddenly we got rid of the IDF, we suddenly got rid of the Israeli government, we suddenly got rid of the borders, and Israelis as they are completely let their weapons down and everything down and were completely exposed now to the enemy, to Hamas and the others, who can then do whatever they want. There are some people around the world who actually have no freaking idea about uh, how people think in the Middle East, will think, oh, yeah, so th that would be a chance for, you know, people just get together and then they could find justice and the future together and stuff. That's not what would happen. The Hamas side and the others would be emboldened by that and would start mass killing the Jews. They would start massacring the Jews. They would spread the idea of massacring the Jews to everyone else. They would encourage each other and say that now the time has come. The time has come to take them all down. The time has come to kill them all. And then once they are at it, you can't talk them out of it anymore because they will simply justify it. They will simply say, we are just, we, we are, we are seeking justice, revenge because of all the things that they have done to us. Not that they have actually done anything. That's also what they would say if the Jews had just popped into existence. They would still say, we have to take revenge for all the things that they have done to us. They would simply start justifying their reasons for massacring the Jews. And even at that point, at some point, maybe human rights organizations and the United Nations and these idiot useful idiot Westerners would wake up seeing that and think, uh-oh, 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 things are getting out of hand. Okay, how about stop, guys? Who the hell is going to listen to these idiots? Do people really think that the that the local, that the Arab population, the Muslim population, would at such a point listen to the United Nations? Does anybody really believe that they would, if they took things into their own hands, 
stop and say, okay, you know, we have to listen to, I don't know, to, to, uh, to this, to, to Candace Owens. We have to listen to Kim uh, from California. We have to listen to what these, you know, what these people over there say in America. We have to listen to the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. They wouldn't care for a second. They don't care. They do not care. They would do whatever they want and they would massacre the Jews. It would be worse than the Holocaust. It would be another Holocaust. This is why... This is why such a situation will never arise. Israel will stay stay strong because, you know what, if it comes down to it, if it becomes an existential uh, war, then the West will not be sufficient. The West will not be there to save Israel because the West cannot even save itself. The West will let, let, let Islamists rape their own children, rape their own girls, and then still, after losing half of their girls and having half of them raped, still think, hmm, maybe we should intervene. Maybe we should intervene, but maybe it's just their culture. I don't know what to do about this. They can't even save their own people, let alone saving Israel. Because they have no idea how these people th think. They have no idea how these people feel. They have no idea how these people, uh, how the, how these people operate and so on, while Israel does, which is why Israel is responding to threats, to terror, to violence, to hate, the way that Israel needs to respond, the way that anyone should be responding. Europe should have the responsibility. Europe should have the moral responsibility to respond to Islamic terrorism the way Israel responds. Unfortunately, Europe has lost their balls. Israel still has them, and I'm glad. <laughs> I think it would be an it would be it would be an act of the gravest evil to even make that contention simply because the Israeli Defense Force stands between seven and a half million Jews in Israel and complete slaughter. And by the way, over two million Arabs and complete slaughter who are citizens of the state of Israel. The only security and peace in the region right now is being guaranteed. Wait a minute. There are Arabs in Israel. That can't be right. They're the genocide by the Israeli military. That is the only force standing between that region and continued chaos. The destruction of the IDF is the destruction of Israel. That means a genocide, a true genocide. The thing that everybody likes to ignore in the Middle East while they're claiming genocide and while they are claiming apartheid is that there's only one area in that specific area that is free of one ethnicity and religion, and it is, quote unquote, Palestine, which has zero Jews living in it. If you drive through the West Bank, there are giant red signs. If you drive into the Palestinian Authority area saying Jews are not allowed in here. And if you drive there without the permission of the Israeli government as a Jew, you will be killed. If you're a Palestinian and you accidentally make your way into Israel, nothing will happen to you. You will go back to Nablus in the evening. If you make it through the checkpoint accidentally, you'll go back. And if you're a Jew and you accidentally drive into Ramallah, you will not emerge alive. That is not, if we are talking about which force here is a force for good and which force here is a force for evil, there is no question what the distinction is. If we're going to talk about institutions that ought to be torn down, we should start with the legacy media, which seems to have radically misinformed you. <laughs> that, was a, that was a very good way to conclude this. Well, that says it all. <laughs> that really says it all. Um, you know what the funny thing is about, uh, about, about the whole apartheid situation? You know, in, in Israel, uh, for those who don't know, for those who are not uh, Israeli, for those who are, uh, there are even Israelis who are not familiar with this. Um, but over the history of, the, of, of Jerusalem, from, for, for, for nearly a thousand years, when uh, the Muslim side held Jerusalem, and when they had control over the Temple Mount, they made it uh, they made it illegal, forbidden for anyone except Muslims to go on the Temple Mount, to to go there and worship there, or to even just go there, to even just go up there. Right? Uh, they wouldn't allow non-Muslims to go up there at all. The Ottoman Empire started uh, having um, had had differing policies on it, but they also generally maintained the position that only Muslims should be allowed to go up there. Uh, others should not be allowed. Israel came in and after the wars took over 
Jerusalem, and even then, even then, Israel uh, still retains the policy of having a custodianship of a custodianship of of uh, of the Temple Mount. Uh, provided by Jordan, and Israel still abides by the policy of only allowing limited numbers of Jews to go up there per day, and uh, tells them that they are not allowed to go and uh, and and pray and and engage in worship and things like that. So Israel still upholds discriminatory policies, uh, discriminatory policies against Jews in territory which they in. <laughs> I can't talk now anymore, in territory which they themselves now occupy. It's very funny. But somehow, somehow the Jews, somehow the Israelis are the bad guys. Somehow they are the bad guys. Somehow the Jews are the ones who engage in discrimination. Somehow they are the ones who engage in apartheid. Somehow they are the ones who treat people differently, despite the fact that Israel goes out of their own way to abide anti-Jewish, anti-non-Muslim discriminatory laws set up by the Muslims. <laughs> It's so ridiculous. In Israeli-controlled territory in Jerusalem, you still cannot go past a certain point unless you are a Muslim. If you say, I'm not a Muslim, but I want to go here, you will be turned around. If you insist on going, you will be arrested. This is Muslim rule, but Israel upholds it so as to not upset uh, you know, the people and... Um, and to, to keep the peace for the moment. I hope that things change in the near future. Jerusalem had enough Muslim power and Muslim authority. And I think one of the things that needs to go, in all honesty, uh, is, the, is, is the, the, the Muslim buildings on the Temple Mount. Inshallah soon. <clears throat> Right. Uh, what did you say? What did you say? Uh, you sent me, who was that? Jingoistic pig. You sent me the timestamps for things. Let's see. What did you send me? Let me have it. Let me have a look here. Let me have a check. Let me have a look here. What did you send me? You said, uh, okay, so you want me to watch uh, certain parts of this, which is what i just reviewed but this is the whole video you want me to watch par parts of this for example here let's have a look let's have a look Appreciate would it be okay if i hold the mic I yeah no worries oh, no worries Greetings, Mr. Shapiro. Uh, I'm born and raised here in Los Angeles, California, a current student here at UCLA. I'm a junior. And I wanted to ask you a question regarding your... All right, so mystery has been solved. Not everyone in California talks like the other guy. Hmm, interesting. ...stance on something a little more relating IR, international relations. Given that Israel is fighting a war to preserve its self-determination while faced with an existential crisis... I can't help but ignore the fact that we see dictatorships, military dictatorships like Azerbaijan waging a war of aggression against a peaceful democracy like Armenia, forcing 120,000 Christian Armenians to flee the region of Nagorno-Karabakh, formerly known as Artsakh. How do you feel about Israel being a democratic country itself, supporting a military dictatorship that is pushing people out of their homes? So I'm not fond of Israel's position with regard to Azerbaijan and, and Armenia, actually with regard to Nagorno-Karabakh. It's a little bit complicated only in the sense that Azerbaijan uh, has been more aligned with the West and Armenia has been, in terms of international relations, kind of weirdly aligned with Iran. And so that, that's complicated a lot of the factors on the ground. But obviously, you know, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh is, is really, really horrifying. Uh, and I think everyone would prefer you know, some, some form of ceasefire and a permanent settlement of borders there as well. I, I, frankly, I wish Armenia were on the other side of Iran, and then that would solve a lot of the problems. I would, I wish that is um, a very reasonable position, which I have heard from most people, uh, Jewish people, pro Israel people that I have uh, heard comment on this issue. And the good thing about Israel is that, it, that you can say that you are not that you don't agree with all the policies that Israel has, you know, it's not like Iran. 
for the same exact thing. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. That's it? That's what you want me to look at? Terrible, terrible. Uh, 10735. Let's do it. Hey, Ben. So my question is about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Okay. I was watching a Norman Finkelstein video some time ago, about a year ago. Why were you watching a Norman Finkelstein video? And how long, how long did it take for you to get through that whole video. I just need to point out one thing here. Yeah. Let's talk about apartheid. <laughs> Where um, I'm still waiting for you to debate him, by the way, if that ever happens. But you previously said before. Well, that can you imagine? <laughs> Actually, we kind of had a uh, we kind of had a had a preview of that when Finkelstein debated Destiny. Destiny and Ben Shapiro pretty much have the same speed of talking. I was like, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. I don't understand what you mean. Blah, 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 blah. Please stop. That the cartoon resolution or the three no's, no peace, no negotiation, no resolution was issued before the Six Days War, implying that the Arabs provoked the war with that doctrine and etc. Um, whereas it's widely accepted that the doctrine was issued um, in September, months after that Six Days War. No, actually, I didn't say about the Khartoum Resolution. Where I said it's the PLO was formed before the Six Day War. It was formed in 1964. And the Palestine Liberation Organization was founded to liberate Palestine, as the name might imply. You might also know that before the Six Day War, Palestine would have just been what would be inside Green Line Israel. The Palestine Liberation Organization then became the Palestinian Authority. So I, I've actually not referenced the Khartoum Resolution on with regard to that timeline. But the foundation of the Palestine Liberation Organization, when the West Bank was in the control of Jordan and the Gaza Strip was in the control of Egypt, is excellent, excellent evidence that the actual Palestine seeking to be liberated was not, in fact, Jerusalem, which at the time was occupied by the Jordanians, or the Gaza Strip, which at the time was occupied by the Egyptians. It was, in fact, Tel Aviv and Haifa. Thank you. That is very, 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 very much accurate. Um... Israel borders. Let's have a look at this. Let's have a look at this, right? People act like <laughs> people act like uh, Israel has been occupying and oppressing these people forever for so many centuries. For so many centuries now, they have been oppressing them, they're occupying the Gaza Strip. What do you expect Gazans to do as a response? Of course, they have to come out and rape. Of course they have to go out and rape. What else do you think they could do? Uh, so here is um, here is Israel. 1949. Map showing the armistice agreement between Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. You can have a look at this map here, and you can see here how Israel is laid out after the war of 1948 so the war of 1948 concludes and israel is then um left with a much significantly bigger region that then initially uh you know allocated to to israel in the 1947 partition plan that's because the other side the arab side fought against israel and lost so Israel ended up with this bunch of land. In fact, let's let's go back to the UN partition plan. Let's go back to the UN partition plan first. Let us go back first. Let us go back to that one first. Let us have a look at that first. So, here is the initial map. I specifically moved it over here to make it smaller. Okay, so, man, sometimes I feel <laughs> very stupid, okay, because I'm using both of these in Wikimedia 
if I scroll into one, I also scroll into the other. What a fantastic thing to do. So anyway, uh, you can see here that the borders are slightly different. Israel has uh, Israel has less land here than it ends up with here. This is the UN partition plan. In the UN partition plan, the these regions are the ones given to Israel, while the other regions are the ones that are separated for a possible Arab state, if the Arabs agree to having their own state. Israel initially uh, wasn't very fond of this idea, thought, first off, um, our country looks ridiculous. <laughs> Secondly, this is a weird solution. It looks like a completely completely unresolved matter. Thirdly, we're giving away a lot of precious land and taking with us a lot of land which we do not even know what to do with, and so on. So this is what they ended up with. However, while Israel agreed to this and declared independence and also even specified that they are happy to recognize uh, an Arab an Arab uh, country, if they decide to announce one, the Arab side didn't agree to it. So the Arab side declared war on Israel together with the surrounding Arab nations with the entire purpose of destroying Israel altogether and taking the entirety of this territory, all of it, for the Arabs. But their goal was not to establish a separate independent um, independent Arab state named Palestine. The goal at this time was to simply take the land and to become part of the wider Arab world, possibly to unite with Egypt and Syria into a huge Arab country or something like that. At this point, the, the, the Arab side, the so-called Palestinians, didn't even have the idea of... Um, of establishing their own independent state. Such an idea was not popular. In fact, the, uh, they were generally against such a thing. At this point, there was no occupation of Gaza and occupation of Palestine or any of that stuff. Arabs, one thing, is, one thing to be kept in mind is these borders were drawn by the British. These borders were drawn by the British when the British took over. The Ottomans didn't have this region separated into one entity. The Ottomans had it divided into multiple different districts. The British came in and drew these borders and said, this is mandatory Palestine, and this is where we will uh, help rebuild the Jewish homeland. That was the entire goal. It never even said, we will, we will uh, have two countries here. The British explicitly said that this here will be designed to rebuild the Jewish national home, the Jewish homeland. Within these borders that were drawn by the British, the Arabs didn't own all of this land. They owned quite a bit of land, but most of this here, for example, was not publicly owned. It was uh, was not privately owned by Arabs or anyone else. It was publicly owned. It belonged to whoever possessed the entirety of the land. Prior to this, it belonged to the to the Ottoman Empire. Much of it was just public property that is just accessible to everyone. So it wasn't for the Arabs to decide who this land belongs to and who it doesn't belong to. If we want to be quite strict, it was up to whoever is in charge of the entirety of this land to decide what happens with it. They didn't have a problem with it when the Ottoman Empire was in charge. They suddenly had a problem with it when the when the British took over and decided that they want to use this to reestablish a home for the Jews. So anyway, they said we don't want Jews here. Attack them, kill them all. The Jews said the Jews said how about no? I don't buy your Ella. And then the Arab side attacked and said, You're finished already! Look at me! Look at me! You know you're done! But then the Jews won. The Jews won and said, What kind of Muslim are you? And then they said, You're hiding, boy! You're hiding! And eventually they said, Lose faith! I tell you, lose faith! It's better for you! So, and then they said, How about you get us released? <laughs> uh... <laughs> And then, um, then the Arab side lost and had to accept their losses and was left with less land. From everything that they had, they, they, 
they were reduced to this little strip and this chunk here. And that's it. The funny thing at this point is that this chunk was occupied by Egypt, not by Palestine. And this part here was not only occupied by Jordan, it was even annexed by Jordan. So Jordan took this entire thing, which people call the West Bank or uh, Israel calls Judea and Samaria, which is it historically known as. Jordan took this entire thing and said, we don't care. We don't care about, about, the other, about what the other Arab countries want. This is going to be part of Jordan from now on. They officially annexed it and said this is part of Jordan and started giving out Jordanian citizenships to the people living here. That's what happened. At this point, at this point, after the war of 1948, in 1949, until 1967, Israel didn't have control over these two regions, which is why Israel couldn't have done anything to these regions. Israel didn't occupy, Israel didn't control, Israel didn't have anything to do with this at all. However, Israel was repeatedly attacked from here and from here by those people, by the Arab people living here. So Israel, when they took over uh, the, this, the, the Sinai Peninsula and this region and this region in 1967, they decided to give back the Sinai Peninsula in return for peace and recognition with Egypt. They made an agreement with Jordan, but Jordan didn't want this back anymore, and Egypt didn't want Gaza back anymore. So Israel was left with these two parts. And they were like, oh, no. So this was all trouble, but uh, now we have this in our hands. What are we supposed to do? You could say that maybe in today's time, lots of people that are that are part of today's Israeli government would be happy to acquire these parts and say, okay, this historically belongs to us, religiously belong to us. Uh, maybe we should just take it and uh, see what we do with it. At that time, at that time, the people, the, the government of Israel was quite different, was very, very secular and leftist. To them, this was nothing but a headache. They didn't want this. They didn't want to deal with it. If they could, they, they would have just taken this part and this part and sent it to outer space, to Mars or something. It was nothing but a headache to them. <laughs> and when they fought Israel in this state... They still only wanted to destroy all of Israel. They didn't just want to, you know, have peace in Gaza or have peace in this region. This also didn't work out. Israel took over and started occupying Judea and Samaria and building settlements for very, very, very simple reasons. Number one, building Jewish settlements in the territory that has that is now occupied will provide safety for the state of Israel and for the people of Israel. Number two. Jews have always lived in these regions. In many places like Hebron, Jews lived uh, forever, uninterrupted, and were actually the ones who were kicked out by the so-called Palestinians. Number three, it looks like the other side just doesn't want to make peace. So how about we'll just work toward eventually uh, owning all of these places? Can you blame them? No. I think they should have done much worse in the past, honestly or better. So anyway, that's that. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm a Christian. I go to Biola University in La Mirada, California. Same part again? Why are we hearing it? What is this? Oh, yeah, you sent me the timestamps. Okay, let's see. Uh, one fourteen. One fourteen. If you drive through the way... Now here we have a magician giving us a question about Israel. All right. Hi, Ben. My name is Mateen. I'm the cha YAF chapter chairman at Golden West College, California. I was born and raised in Iran. I became a proud U.S. citizen last year. Awesome. Thank you. And you have a slick vest. Look at that oh, vest. Thank you. So I was yeah, you're one of us now. You're American. Which says me, who just became an American citizen several years ago. 
gonna ask you, uh, why didn't Israel just go in and wipe out the Hamas terrorists a week after the attack? And then these gender bending cosplay terrorists would have forgotten about, forgotten about it by now if they did that. <laughs> so the, the truth is that, that Israel has been, again, extraordinarily meticulous in the, in the prosecution of this particular war, whether it is the shipping in of legitimately hundreds of thousands of tons of humanitarian aid into a region. I find it funny how people from the, um, from the Middle East or just places like that are much more um, brutal in their language and wording of these things compared to Western people region where the civilian population largely supports Hamas or, or whether you're talking about how they prosecute this war on an individual level. Uh, they've been incredibly thorough. They're continuing to be incredibly thorough. I think everyone is frustrated the war didn't move faster. Part of that was because the United States was forcing the Israelis to slow walk it. Uh, the Biden administration has been egregious in its prosecution of the war. Their attempt to push Israel, for example, not to go into Rafah is one of the most obvious and stupid blunders in the history of modern American foreign policy. This war would have ended very quickly if the United States had been under the, if Donald Trump had been president for First of all, I don't think several would have happened. Mm -hmm. And number two, it would have been solved very quickly. This is very, very interesting. Ben Shapiro has never been a Donald Trump supporter. Um, in fact, in the early days of when Donald Trump was running for president, when Donald Trump became president, throughout his presidency, Ben Shapiro was mostly critical of, of Donald Trump. Um, he... I think he maintained throughout that he always thought Donald Trump was a uh, was the wrong person to be president and so on. Uh, I, I think he would still. Um, I'm not sure how his views are on Donald Trump at this moment, but that said, he has always maintained that there is something very very good about Donald Trump, which is that he is firm, that he actually cares about national security unlike the ones that we have in charge right now, like the old man and that cackling woman. Um, and also, honestly, Donald Trump had a way of talking <laughs> to certain world leaders, to certain politicians, to certain, uh, certain groups. He loves Trump now. He wants Trump. Yeah, I, I saw him recently saying that he wants Donald Trump to be president uh, again, which was surprising to me. I haven't followed the whole um, his his views on that kind of stuff. Um, here's Justin Wooten saying American Jews extensively oppose anyone working class white support. Justin, I doubt that you are actually a an actual American white person. You you act like some. You act like your name is. Uh, Abdullah Majid uh, something something and you're LARPing as a white person uh, Jews in America when we talk about Jews in America there there are two parts of Jewish America they are the secular ones the more left-leaning ones who are basically like the left-leaning Americans and then there are the conservative the religious ones in America, who are basically like the Republicans, basically like the Christians. For some weird reason, people like you make it all about Jews when the leftist Jews oppose conservative policies. However, you don't make it about white people or Christians when regular American leftists do the very same thing. <laughs> When religious Jews in America, conservative Jews, right-wing Jews support Republicans and support conservative policies and so on, you somehow don't credit them for that, but you credit Christians for supporting the conservative side. What's wrong with you? This just looks like um, a great failure in your in your uh, in in your thinking capabilities, or you're just pretending to be some white guy. I don't know. Alhamdulillah. Uh, yeah. So that's that's what it is. Religious Jews uh, have always been supportive of the conservative side. And the reason for that is very simple. If Donald Trump had been president on October 8th, Donald Trump would have said publicly, the Israeli military will get all the help they need to completely eviscerate Hamas and establish some form of working order in the Gaza Strip. If Hezbollah crosses that line, we are going to give Israel everything it needs to pummel Hezbollah into the ground, and we're removing our airbrace from Qatar until they, and, uh, unless Qatar actually facilitates the exit of all of the hostages currently being held by Hamas. Then, 
I have a simple request. So when you're talking about Iran, please make sure to separate our people yes. from the yes, 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 from For the sure. rotten. That's that's very that's very very nice. I've heard this thing repeatedly from uh, Iranians who say, please, when you say Iran, refer to the Islamic Republic or Islamic regime of Iran, but please don't just refer to them as Iran. We are Iran. Those evil people, they're not Iran. That is something worth respecting. That is something worth respecting. When it comes to Trump and Israel, by the way, there's something that I recently saw, which I also thought I should have a look at. Uh, so Trump, when he was on PBD, but Iran and PBD commented on this. You're saying after November 5th, pre as a president elect, you're saying things are going to get done during that time? I'd like to be able How to. How about Iran and Israel? What, what about uh, that one? Uh, well, that depends. A lot's happening right now. I know We're going to have is. to see what right. happens. Okay. That one is a very interesting one. And it's become more interesting because Israel didn't listen to Biden and, and her and did what they wanted to do. And they put themselves in a pretty strong position. I mean, let's face it. Who would have thought this was going to happen? He's very correct on one thing here. Israel didn't listen to what Biden and Kamala wanted from Israel. And as a result, Israel is now in a much better position in the entirety of the conflict, not only in Gaza, but in the entire conflict, in the entire Middle East. Biden, the old man, and that and the and that woman, Kamala, they've always been insisting on okay, okay let's do a ceasefire and stuff. Yeah, let's do ceasefire. They were even opposing publicly at least, uh, Israel operating in Rafah. Yahya Sinwar was found in Rafah. That's where he was killed. That's where he was taken out. Had he had Israel listened to uh, Biden, they would have never gone into Rafah, and Yahya Sinwar would still be alive. I'm glad that they never listened. Uh, everybody was very afraid of Iran. They're less afraid of Iran now. What they did to Hezbollah and Hamas, if you take a look no, at what's that a law, they, they took everybody out. I mean, the, no, the I pagers mean, no, there. No, the whole thing with the pagers. Right. It was from the pagers that, because those were your leaders. I mean, those were the leaders. It was That's like 2,000 right. or 3,000 And people the guy that replaced them, they out. took him out as well. I mean, uh, that was that, because so nobody wants like that job. And I was like, hey, would you like this the job? <laughs> I'll pass. I don't want the, the job. Right. Day. Right. So it's a different, you know, it's a different story. But only because BB did not listen to Biden. Biden wanted everything to just sort of right. foment um they wouldn't listen to him alhamdulillah he also further said apparently um during a speech this here don't do this all our great everything's a failure and he's telling bb netanyahu don't do this don't do that don't do this all our great congressmen are there and don't do any of these things. And uh, Bibi didn't listen to them. And I tell you what, they're in a much stronger position now than they were three months ago. That's for sure. Nobody's ever seen anything like like has happened. And Bibi called me today and he said, uh, it's incredible what's happened. They said, it's pretty incredible. But he wouldn't listen to Biden because if he did, they wouldn't be in this position. And she's worse than him. She's not as smart as him. And I'm not saying he's the smartest. <laughs> <laughs> of course, can't avoid taking a little dig at that guy. Uh, and I've also seen this year. They should have some people excited. We will remove the jihadist sympathizers and Jew haters. We're going to remove the Jew haters who do nothing to help our country. They only want to destroy our country. And we will never let the horrors of October 7th be repeated here on American soil. We will not let that happen. And we will solve the problem that we have. See, I have... Um, I really don't... I have a problem with Donald Trump. And in an ideal world, I wouldn't vote for Donald Trump. I would, I would, I would want to vote for somebody else in an ideal world where there are different options. However, he is right on these things. 
and I think right now there is just a it is a crucial moment in history in foreign politics and so on and if I'm left between Donald Trump and the other guys I'm I'm, I'm certainly not voting for the other guys that's that Islamic Republic. I agree. The they Iranian government, our country. The Iranian government is evil, and the yep. people of Iran are incredible. They're yep. awesome. Yep. Truly. Hi, Ben. My husband and I are huge fans of you. We listen to you every day. Um, and I wanted to let you know that you actually inspired us to start our own podcast about politics in California called The California Conversation. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm pretty sure this has nothing to do with Israel. But it's kind of nice. Uh, one nineteen. Let's see. Oh, here we have a juicy. Um, <laughs> we're both. Hi, Ben. Given that we're both wearing the Jew hat that helps us control the weather, <laughs> I think it's clear why me or you would want to support Israel, or um, why someone who's Ukrainian would want to support Ukraine. But how would you make the argument to someone who's purely pro-American and an isolationist? on why we should be giving billions of dollars to foreign aid, especially that now that we're over $1.5 trillion of debt in America. Sure. So there's, there's sort of, there are a few arguments. So argument number one is the realistic benefit that you get from having allies in the world. So the fact is that the United States military, for example, has described Israel as America's best aircraft carrier in the Middle East. It's a giant aircraft carrier for American values and intel. The United States gets an enormous amount of Middle Eastern intel from the Israelis. I mean, you can see how good Mossad is, by the way. Like, how, how amazing is Mossad? I mean, I've already told people that for Purim, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's like Jewish Halloween. Uh, I'm planning on my family dressing up as Avi's Beeper Emporium for, for Halloween. Um, but the, the, amount of, the amount of intel that the United States receives while working with the Israelis is very high. Also, the United States does have a military tech arrangement with Israel, where Israel is amazing at developing innovative new tech. And then the United States does get a window into a lot of that newly developed tech and it ends up in a lot of American military technology. Beyond that, the United States does want a counterweight to, say, Iran in the region, because Iran threatening its neighbors is really bad for a global oil supply. Iran being nuclear is a threat to Saudi Arabia. So there are actual real politic reasons to be interested in these things. Like, this is why I'm interested in Ukraine. It's not particularly because of democracy versus dictatorship argument is because I think that Russia takes positions adversarial to those of the United States throughout the world, ranging from Asia to Africa to the Middle East. And I think that anything that bleeds Russia is actually quite good for the United States. And so that war, Ukraine withstanding Russian predation, which would then push up against NATO's borders completely, I think is a, is a very good thing, even though I'm pushing for an off ramp to the war that would basically solidify the borders where they currently are. So argument number one, sort of a real politic argument. Argument number two is that it's a this is very nice because um, I like to talk a lot about the historical aspects of it, uh, about the uh, Israeli Israel's values, Jewish versus Islamic aspects, and so on, whatever it is. But um, this is a question that comes up uh, to me, and and I and I basically know the essence of why it is it is it is useful for America to be siding and supporting um, supporting uh, you know Israel here. Um, I hope you're joking. <laughs> uh, now you threw me off. However, yeah, Ben Shapiro has a has a much better way of of explaining explaining this aspect than I would, for example, when it comes to the uh, defense industry, security, politics, and so on a lot cheaper, it turns out, to do prevention than it is to do uh, filling the gap once the gap has emerged. So there's this weird idea in sort of isolationist circles that if the United States withdraws from an area, then that area just sort of sits there and nothing happens and nothing could be further from the truth. When the United States withdraws from the world, generally our enemies tend to fill the gap. This is particularly true, for example, when it comes to the freedom of the seas. Every product that you own has been a beneficiary of the freedom of the seas guaranteed by the United States Navy and its allies. And so if the United States were to withdraw from, say, the South China, the funny thing is when he just started like that, every product you own, I thought he was going to go into a commercial. This is sponsored by this and this company. I see, because it costs too much money or not care about Taiwan. The consequences for your actual daily life would be disastrous. If China were to simply take Taiwan and destroy TSMC or TSMC would destroy itself, basically every single electronic device you own. Inheritor, I hope Bloom is joking. AP has never been a misogynist. I'm pretty sure that was a joke because... <laughs>
because that girl came on to speak and then I and then I skipped. Uh, I think that was the joke. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> would be would be kaput. You couldn't you couldn't get a new iPhone. You couldn't get anything. It would all be gone. So you know, it turns out again that vacuum foreign policy abhors a vacuum, and so there is a, a lot to the idea that having powerful allies is an excellent deterrent. And this is where I like to tell my favorite Donald Trump story. So uh, President Trump. I did a fundraiser for President Trump. Uh, maybe three months. Uh, if you want to watch it, go and see it there. I'm not going to listen to the Donald Trump story. You see, it's going to be painful. Huh? Hi, Ben. Hope you're doing well. So I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but... Jingoistic, is there anything else interesting here, actually? Or did you just tag random things? Uh, Jubilee one is more contentious. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Jubilee. Let's let's look at the Jubilee video. Jubilee. Of course, it's called Jubilee, and then they invite the Jew to talk, you see? This just shows everything. This proves everything. Um... All right, what do you want me to look at here? They're footing in the door for different. For you too. This program here is different. What? <sighs> I'm not saying anything. I appreciate that. <laughs> Hi, hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So, um, I kind of want to shift the conversation about DEI a little bit away from culture because I don't know if that's necessarily like a helpful conversation to have. And I really want to talk more about representation. So, um, one in five Americans currently is Hispanic. This country, like it or not, is not a homogenous country. We are a very diverse country. Mm -hmm. Do you not think that our legislators should be representative of the overall population? Uh, I don't see a way that you can have a quote unquote. Okay, so I asked Jingoistic earlier to help me with uh, to to send me relevant things here in this in this um, in this video, and then uh, he sent me certain timestamps here, and he said Jewish id ten fifty, and I have no idea what this is. Representative legislature with four hundred and thirty five members of of Congress and a country of three hundred forty million people, because you can divvy that up however you want. It's not by race; you could do it by sex, you could do it by gender, you could do it by sexual orientation. How exactly do you decide? What is quote unquote the representative group? And also, I don't believe that individuals ought to be represented based on group identity. So, for example, I'm Jewish. I don't. Th Jews are actually overrepresented in Congress. I don't think that that we ought to decide exactly. You see, Ben Shapiro admits that Jews rule the government. How many people in Congress are Jewish based on the Jewish population of the country? I think that's that's actually a pretty silly way to do representation. Well, we don't have to do it systematically, but fundamentally, there is an issue with the fact that we are not fully represented. Like the entire population is not represented. I mean, we Okay, I don't care. I really don't care about this discussion. I really don't give a care. Oswar would not have started under Donald Trump. <laughs> it's good. This process has gotten more conciliatory over the course of time. Okay, so uh, what evidence do you have to support that question? Okay, so the... the uh, it's Muhammad, we have to say. Okay. Latest reports... His name was Muhammad, that's why. From the New York Times of internal papers from Yahya Sinwar suggested that he was essentially counting on Iranian interference and help with the October 7th attacks. And that was incentivized by the fact that Iran was attempting to forestall any sort of deal between Israel and the Saudi government to, for, for Saudi to join the Abraham Accords. It was, it was very well known at the time, and I happen to know, that the, the Saudi government was very much ready to join the Abraham Accords if Donald Trump had been reelected. If that had happened, that would have forestalled Hamas action because the incentive to have done what, what happened on October 7th would largely have been gone at that point. The entire purpose of that attack was to prevent the formation of a broader Sunni Israeli okay. specifically. Because if we expect that the October 7th attacks only happened because Iranian influence in the area, I don't see how 17 years of a land, air, sea blockade will happen if, uh, if that's not a symptom to, to allowing people basically to basically pressure cook into its way into something like that happen. Okay, the, the, the idea that October 7th was specifically as an incident caused by movement between Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah and coordination between those groups for geopolitical reasons 
is the claim. If the claim that you're making is that October 7th was sort of a, an inevitability based on the conditions on the ground in the Gaza Strip, that's not exactly how I think foreign policy. So um, he is uh, – it's interesting that Ben Shapiro doesn't even respond to that aspect, but uh, he, he, he makes the whole – he gets into the point of uh, imposing a land, air, and sea blockade on, on Gaza. Land, air, and sea blockade. Look um, – Israel had a blockade on Gaza, and Egypt did too. And um, this was this was supported by Egypt. This was supported by Israel, and this was even for quite a while supported by the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. They even supported it at some point. Later, they acted like they don't want anything to do with it, but they approved of it as well. Egypt built a huge wall <laughs> between Gaza. This blockade was put in place for very, very simple reasons. Israel said, we took control of Gaza because of constant terrorist attacks and so on, Israel decided to leave Gaza in 2005. We explained this 50 million times, so I'll just make it very short. Israel decided to leave Gaza in 2005 uh, and said, uh, we will keep a blockade in place and work toward a um, restricting it and easing it more and more gradually. Let's see what uh, Gaza does. Gaza, of course, uh, immediately uh, elected Hamas. Hamas kicked out the other uh, Palestinians and said, no recognition, no peace process, we will finish Israel, we will destroy Israel. So Israel said, all right, then we will not get rid of the blockade. That's it. That's why there is a blockade. Don't cry about the blockade. No, I'm saying foreign policy works in the sense that you can't ignore the overlying cause of an issue. So now when we, when we talk about the Abraham Accords, do you not think that the Palestinian people not involved in the Abraham Accords plays any part? Into, into the region remaining unstable, specifically with these two groups of people? The region got specifically much more stable while Donald Trump was president because of the Abraham Accords. With this is the most boring thing I've heard in my entire life. So um, not watching this any further. Most boring thing I've heard in my entire life. There is nothing interesting here. Nothing interesting at all. Nothing interesting happening in the world. I know that uh, some people say that there has been a, that, there, that, that uh, they would be interested in looking at this whole thing between... Um, Pierce Morgan and what's that guy's name? That clown. Bassem Yusuf. But I'm really not interested in it because Bassem Yusuf is the most annoying person I've seen in my entire life. And I don't want to listen to it at all. I don't want to give it a single second of my life. Uh, in other news, I, um, I'm currently in talks with Pierce Morgan's show to get on there and have some discussions i will share more updates on that soon inshallah inshallah there's nothing interesting here it's terrible 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 stuff whoever told me to watch his videos is a terrible person <laughs> all right uh let's see Paolo Lungaro, AP, I suffer from depression and anxiety. I watch your streams because you make me laugh. Thank you so much. That's very, very, very nice. So you're saying my channel is a joke to you. You're saying this is a joke to you. You think this is a joke? This is serious stuff, man. This is serious, serious stuff. <coughs> uh, but, but yeah, I, I appreciate that. That's very, very good to know. It's very good to know. Asa, shalom, Habibi. I love to you and all the fans. Habibi, love to you and all the fans. Okay. Habibi, love to you too. Go to Hub. Facts don't care about your Palestine. Go to Hub. Stop it. That one Jewish girl, there's an even worse Abu Ubaidah song than the one you reacted to that one time. It's hilariously bad. Also, what a waste of a hoti. I hope they all die. All the Abu Ubaidahs. Fox McCloud, uh, just here a, a little a little disclaimer for the youtube moderators watching i'm referring to the terrorists to the hamas terrorists it's very clear when i say abu ubaidas okay learn to think fox mccloud corrupting one another that's what they do indeed urinating upon one another that's what they do let's see 
Now Jingoistic Pig said, sorry, you found it boring. It's your fault, Jing. I'm just kidding. It's not your fault. I, I was thinking of reacting to that video, and that's why I asked you for more about on that video, on that video, because I didn't watch any of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> thank you for helping out. Brian Lovery said, just watch Chunk and Mosab on Pierce, and it was so funny. Some of Chunk best work yet. Hope you and David Wood do a video on it. What do you mean? Do you live under a rock or something? Or was there another was there another chunk versus Mossab? We just did that like several days ago, like two days ago. What are you talking about? Ian Bridge, what annoyed me the most out of Ben cheerleading genocide and ethnic cleansing was him not knowing how to pronounce Lord. Uh loud. I find it amazing that Ben cheerleaded th these things. Shake Mike Wingling, I see Daily Wire got so humiliated by CD, he's still hiding. He is, he is. Paul Lungar, there is no Christians in California. That is true. It's verified, scientifically proven true. Body Rabbit, it's a young generation thing. They're all like this. As an is an attempt at validation of perspective. Here it's used as a lampshade because the future is bleak. LOL. Yeah, but no, the thing is also that the guy sounded a little bit on the on the, you know interesting side buddy rabbit that kid can claim he's a starfish from jupiter that doesn't mean anything if he says something stupid all the time uh pretty sure that a starfish from jupiter wouldn't even be able to say anything but i get the point jj made the super chat thank you so much appreciated af iron zombie yahya for halloween <laughs> with pager prosthetics uh that would be funny Muhammad, I'm not, it's not, if not for the sheer amount of backlash Israel would get from the international community, I wish they would level it. I would say that uh, leveling it would probably not be the best solution because even in times of, even in such drastic situations, it would probably not be the best thing to level the whole place. However, I would say they should be much harsher. Uh, dog, it's a yamuka, homie, no cap, all facts. Oh yeah, that's wait, that's from his rap song, from Ben Shapiro's one rap song. Ibigi said the Muhammad Hijab soundboard is too funny, bro. It's it's not funny. This is serious. This is very very serious. This man has real problems. Zero zero Govan gifted a membership. Thank you, appreciate it. Muhammad. <laughs> Said, I'm not sure how anyone can call themselves a Christian and not support Israel. How can you be a follower of Christ and hate God's chosen people? Well, there is some nuance to this. Let's be, uh, in all honesty, there is some nuance to this. There has always been, um, you could you could probably say that the Christian and Jewish world is closer today than they have ever been. If there is more of a of a of a friendship and collaboration between uh, Jews and Christians today than there has ever been, uh, be these are some recent developments in history. Both the Jewish side and the Christian side had um, had had very 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 problematic and opposing views about each other. The, the The Jewish side was like, let's not talk about Christians and let's not talk. Let's not have any conversations about this at all. And the Christian side was like, okay, we don't want to hear anything about Jews. Um, so it's it's largely the Protestant. Um, it's largely a Protestant trend that brought this collaboration uh, between Jews and Christians that is so popular today into uh, into the foreground, and also. It's not just Protestants. Also, the Catholic Church, when um, the Catholic Church uh, on uh, in in Vatican II, clearly and officially acknowledged that any hostility against Jews based on something that they may have collectively done or any such accusations are false and are not condoned by the church and are indeed worthy of condemnation. So uh, both Protestants and uh, the Catholic Church have made significant steps toward being, you know, brotherly 
and 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 all that with the uh, with the with the Orthodox, with the, with the Jewish community. And these are very re recent developments. It wasn't quite like that in the past. And in the in the past, especially um, not in the first century, but uh, from the second century onward in Christian history, there was um, this this idea among Christianity um, started taking over that references in the Bible to um, to, to chosenness or Israel or Jewish or whatever uh, no longer apply to Jewish people um, but only apply in one way but that uh, that Christians have basically replaced Jewish people and that Jewish people are also supposed to become Christians and and so on so that was a very dominant worldview so yeah anyway uh very very complicated stuff depending on where you stand and what Christian uh, group and idea you go with this idea that as a Christian you are supposed to support Israel because they are the chosen people may not necessarily appeal to you. A lot of uh, Orthodox Christians, for example, will not agree with this. You know, Alhamdulillah, that's that. W said, review the recent Mossab Hassan Yusuf talk at Harvard, inshallah, maybe one day. I will. I think I will go live tomorrow as well. So we'll have we'll do that. Yeah, early Christians vehemently rejected Judaism and went out of, their, out of their way to distance themselves from their Jewish roots. It's really, um, you know, it's kind of a, it's funny to make it about both sides. But here is the thing: so the early Christians were Jews. Everyone considered them them Jews. The Jews considered them Jews. The Christians said that the the the, the Jews referred to them as Jews. They refer to them as fellow Jewish believers, fellow Jewish brethren, whatever it is. The earliest Christians were Jews. Jesus was a, a devout Jew. He observed Jewish practices. Um, the earliest followers of Jesus were all Jews. The earliest, uh, the, the, the Christians who started forming after the death of Jesus were all you know, they they would go to the synagogues. They would go to the temple to participate in Jewish practices. They would still wear, um, they would do the the tefillin and uh, wear the the tzitzit, the what's it, the tassels, and so on, like like Jews do. It was later on that, in fact, the Jewish rabbis started distancing themselves a little bit from the Christians who were participating in Jewish worship and saying uh, we can't have this anymore man we have to we have to separate because we are contradicting each other in our beliefs and and all that um and just around that same time the Christianity also started splitting and distancing itself further and further from the Jewish community and Within the first and second centuries Christianity eventually split and became its own religion. To the Romans in the second century still considered it uh, just another Jewish cult. They thought it as a Jewish cult and thought uh, it's a pathetic, pathetic pacifist Jewish cult and we don't want it. That was the Roman position. And one of their main problems with it was was that Jews don't want was was that Christians don't like violence. So it was uh, it was a, a particularly pacifist, pathetic Jewish cult that should be oppressed, that should be suppressed. That's basically how they viewed it. Of course, uh, Christianity grew faster and faster and faster, started um, transcending Jewish bounds and preaching to Gentiles and spreading among them. Eventually, the Romans started recognizing it as a separate religion from Judaism and so on. But anyway, the point is that um, that history because of that early split between Jews and Christians, host hostilities on both sides toward each other developed. It was always mutual until very recent times, which is why I say today it has kind of, today Jews and Christians have come much closer together and they are probably more friendly to each other and more uh, allied than they have ever been, which is a good thing to see. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> Didn't Peter the Apostle want to keep early followers of Jew Jewish uh, closer to their you mean of Jew of Jesus closer to their Jewish roots? But Paul wanted them to appeal to Gentiles more. Uh, that's pretty much my understanding. Somebody else could probably clarify that uh, in a, in a better way. But uh, 
pretty much that is seems to be true. Paul had this very firm position on um, there were these the, the, the there was the community called the Juda Judaizers uh, among the Christians who insisted that they should still practice Jewish um, commandments and so on. But Paul said, "No, we don't have to do that. We don't have to tell the Gentiles to get circumcised and so on." Uh, anyway, W, review the recent, I already said, read this. Autumn Sun, do you think Muslims would accept the buildings on the temple site being moved next to the mound or it being on top of the mound that they want? Do you think Muslims would accept the buildings on the temple site being moved next to the mound or it being on top of the mound that they want? I think that, um, that Muslims just want everything to be kept exactly the way they want it, exactly exactly the way they have built it, and they don't want anyone to. To them, it's all an issue. Like, we built this, we rightfully did this. It belongs to us. You Jews don't get to say what we do with our place. This is how they are viewing it. And to, to Muslims, any attempt to change anything about uh, about their place in Jerusalem is something apocalyptic. This is why some people are concerned that uh, about the, about the Al Aqsa, that if if there were attempts by the Jewish side to remove um, to remove the 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 dome and the Al Aqsa, then uh, Muslims around the world could go crazy about this and could go berserk about this and so on. But I think uh, fears like that should be confronted and it should be removed. Uh, Muslims have taken over enough places around the world. They don't need uh, the one Jewish place also as their own. Telegraph, need to add some Mossab since buttons. I do. I do need to add some more buttons to this stuff. Uh, Key Kavus laughed my ass off when you told the Israel Palestine story with the soundboard. Now I can't find my ass since it fell. You should look under your table. That's usually where it goes. Um, that was a funny way of putting it. Maybe I should just. Get the hell out of here! I didn't mean to push that seriously. <laughs> Maybe I should do that. I should make a video explaining the conflict in the most basic terms, and I should just use pictures and then push buttons. So the Arabs came and said. You're finished already! Look at me! Look at me! You know you're done! But then the Jews said... Be quiet, man! And so on. That sounds like a good idea. Uh, I don't understand how some people don't like juice. Yeah, I, I don't I don't drink juice very much, but I like juice. Uh, Bigot Sandwich became a YouTube member. Welcome to the club. There is no getting out. If you want to leave, you will, bad things will happen to you. Uh, w, get out there. Vote Trump 2024. That's what you said, not what I said. Ryan, AP said, I think they, Israel, should have done much worse, better. A busted boohoo was not like that. <laughs> yeah, he made a whole video about... Uh, he put he put me on the thumbnail saying, Israel should have been much harsher. I still stand by that. Yes, I say it again. I say it here one more time. Israel should be much harsher. How about that? <clears throat> Programmer X, I can't wait till our new pro-Israel prime minister gets elected next year, Pierre Polivier in Canada. Then I think uh, that then I can drink more pro-Palestine tears. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Knows too much. Risking the lives of your soldiers for the lives of enemy civilians is not moral. It's immoral, suicidal altruism, especially when most of them aren't innocent and assist support destroying you. I do not fully disagree. It's also immoral to resupply your enemy in war, which is what the humanitarian aid is. Only Israel is demanded to do this. Immoral double standards. I do not completely disagree. Uh, Tick Voon says the West Bank is a bank, so it obviously belongs to the Jews. <laughs> that, that was the worst joke of the day. I wish I could delete this minute from my life. Uh, <laughs> that was pretty good. McKellen, lol. Oof, Shreks with Ben would be grueling. A -a -a -oy. Yeah. Yes. Michael Feldman, AP, the Turks are bombing the Kurds because of one of the terrorist attacks. That uh, That's chutzpah. Yeah. Um, yeah. People should be going on screaming free, free Kurdistan, but they're not. I don't know why. 
I don't know why. Libele said Bassam is a comedian. I had more funny migraines. Th that's the thing. Um, I still remember one day when I was looking for content to cover on my live stream, and David suggested we should look at that Bassam Yusuf thing because it was funny. And I started watching it, and I just got so annoyed with it. I can't take that guy, man. I can't stand that guy. If I was asked to talk to that guy, I would probably reject it. Although I would like to say some really, really bad things to him. Arnold's... I like you, bro. I hope you like me too. Alhamdulillah. No, I don't. You will be defeated, Jenk. You are going to be defeated. You're already defeated. <laughs> bro made JC give you his peace and fill you with his love. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Buddy Rabbit, unrelated to your new logo's cartoon teeth look like a white fist punching out from the back of Mo's throat. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. I posted earlier that this is the new logo. Let's see what... <laughs> I don't even remember what it looks like because I was just... I, I was working on different possibilities for a logo and then and then came up with this and thought, hey, I should share this and see what people say. New logo. <clears throat> I kind of feel like... Um, the logo that I currently have is getting a little bit old. I need something new. And I don't know if this is if this is good. But yeah, it does look like a fist. I see what you're saying there. Too friendly. It's too iconic to change. I know that's the thing. It it feels look. It's it's beautiful. It's brilliant. The fact that it is crappy is what makes it so great. But the thing is, everything gets old. Everything dies. Maybe it's time to move on. Maybe it's time to do something more, more serious instead of this, like like that like over there, yeah, like that there, like that. Well, I have this, but maybe it's time to have something more, you know, more serious, to be taken more seriously. So maybe I should therefore have something like this now. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> Body rabbit. Uh, Yanan Dixon Normas. Love from Scotland. Love from Scotland. Where David was scared he'll convert you. Yeah. Yeah. He's scared. You're finished already. Look at me. Look at me. You know you're done. Kekavus, those Romans who didn't like early Christians sound an awful lot like Nietzsche. Uh, a little bit, a little bit. Nietzsche had a big problem with... Uh, it's very funny. He had kind of this... Well, not, I'm going to go on a rant about Nietzsche again now. <laughs> he had a problem with Jews and Christians because he had a problem with Judaism and Christianity. He was like, this is the weaklings. This is religion and morality for weaklings. They're hypocrites. We need to get rid of their morality. But he also had a problem with people who hate Jews. He was kind of based in a way, but also not. Steph S. Uh, made a super sticker. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, see, my wife said it best. He had a problem with himself. That's true. Nietzsche had a problem with himself. Alhamdulillah. Uh, what do you think will happen to Bibi after the war? Does he have a chance at getting re-elected? I think that um, the polls generally show that uh, that he is still favored. But if the war ends, I'm not sure how it will go. I don't think anything bad will happen to him. But... Uh, it might just be his time as prime minister might just be over. And wouldn't it be fantastic if he finished it with a very, very successful and good way of, of putting an end to this war? In all honesty, I never really knew how to, um, what to think about uh, the Netanyahu government, the Likud government, and so on. But I have nothing but respect for, for Bibi during this war. 
although I think there were mistakes, everyone makes mistakes. I have I have nothing but respect for the way uh, BB's government handled the war so far. Such a such a crucial and critical war. And he has been fantastic in his appeals to the public, both nationally and internationally, deserves nothing but respect. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Mark K just went back and forth with a clown on X that bought the Gaza victim narrative. I presented facts, data, and websites showing him that there was hatred against Jews prior to 1948 till today. Another useful idiot for Hamas. This is why I want to uh, why I, I want to go on Pierce Morgan and other places to address one certain thing that people just don't like to talk about. And I want to talk about the brutal anti-Semitism, the brutal Jew hatred in the Palestinian society and the pre-Israeli pre, uh, Arab society long before any of this happened. This is all... I, st I still say, I would still maintain, and I will hold on to this and uh, accept any challenges on this. I would still maintain that uh, one of the, the, that that one of the main reasons, if not the biggest reason, for the ongoing bloody conflict and bloody war is Islam. It is Islam. Islam fuels hatred. Islam fuels disgusting attitudes islam fuels disgusting hatred toward others especially against jews and there are people out there who are like no it's not true you just don't understand what the hell are you talking about man i roamed the muslim world i walked among muslims i grew up as a muslim i learned as a child that that jews are basically evil monsters this is what muslims learn around the world this is what muslims have learned forever at the core, and this is what I want Jews to understand as well. Uh, yes, I know you have a very nice relationship with with the uh, with the local Arab Muslims, and uh, Israel is doing a fantastic job at integrating people in a very inter interesting way. But I'm sorry, but it's it's it simply is true, and it's a very uh, dark fact which needs to be pointed out that Islam is a major problem, and as long as Islam is there as a force in the Middle East, there will always be a problem. As long as Islam is in the equation, there will always be brutal Jew hatred. There will always be another attempt to want to wipe out the Jews and so on. Islam is fundamentally messed up and genocidal. And if you don't believe me, I can always bring out the receipts again. Since it is so difficult, since it's so difficult to believe this, I can always bring out the receipts once again for all those who just don't want to know or don't want to learn. Here it is. Muslims around the world know this. Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger there is no Ayn here, man. Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger as saying, the last hour... Okay. The last hour would not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews and the Muslims would kill them until the Yahud would hide themselves behind a stone or a tree and their stone or a tree would say, Muslim, Oh, servant of Allah, there is a Yahud behind me. Come and kill him. But the tree would not say, for it is the tree of the Yahud. Or if you want to listen to it in a more civilized way, it would be Abu Huraira reported Allah's messenger as saying the last hour would not come unless the muslims will fight against the jews and the muslims would kill them until the jews would hide behind a stone or a tree and a stone or a tree would say muslim servant of allah there is a jew behind me come and kill him but the tree cargot would not say for it is the tree of the jews this is what islam is this is what muslims believe sorry to say but this is the reality these are the facts and if you deny this then you're finished already look at me look at me you know you're done that's what they do. I'm wearing, uh, yeah, I'm not reading that. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, yeah. 
I tell you something about Jews. When I hit very hard times, the only one who helped me was a Jew. Being German, that was humbling. I love these people, says Lebel. Jews can be fantastic people. That's the impression that I had when I went to Israel. And I know that there are lots of Jews watching nowadays. And I know that, that I have... Um, that I have invited quite a, a Jewish audience over this last year. But that is not by coincidence. And I'm not saying this to win the hearts of the Jews, but I love you guys. I love you guys. And this is the impression that I had when I went to Israel. And it it really it 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 overwhelmed me a little bit, and I spoke to David and to, uh, about it, and I mentioned it so many times since I since I came back, which uh, this 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 feeling that I had when I was there, that I had on my on my way back, that I have still to this day, which is that um, I was very very much pro Israel, and very much fond of Jews and Jewishness and all that before I went to Israel. But after I went to Israel, I'm a little bit surprised by how how much more positive my view and my impression of Jews and Israelis became when I went there. And I thought, this is amazing. It is absolutely amazing. And I still say it, it is. It is. I did go to so many places, and it's, it's. It's. I never wanted to go back to a place as much as I wanted to go back to Israel. Sometimes, still, like <laughs> this whole year since uh, I went there and came back, I feel like I just want to go back to Israel and do more stuff there. It's, I don't know. It's amazing. I love it. But yeah, that's that. <clears throat> no need to get emotional. This is serious stuff. Um, this is serious stuff. Serious, serious stuff. Alhamdulillah. All right. Uh, anything else? Earlier, I was creating. I was creating a song for Yahya Sinwar. <laughs> Got carried away making a song for Yaya Sinwar. Let's see how it sounds. <laughs> to shame a man of devotion fierce and fine who trade a thousand lives just to shine in tunnels you stay safe and sly not out of fear but too precious to die i wish i was your wife on the day of the fight when Gaza was exposed and you went to hide You sent boys with stones to dance with the drones Kept Gaza alive while breaking their bones You knew where to hide when to retreat Only a fool throws their heart at defeat Oh yeah, yeah, yeah my heart is crushed like your skull when a sniper silenced your hush You hid till the end, fierce as a dove And fled to the arms of the martyr's love It's beautiful, it's beautiful isn't it? Remember the tomb where Israel removed You thanked them by killing, your will wasn't moved What's mercy from those 
you swore to defy Their kindness to you was just one more lie With hate in your heart, you sharpened each plan How could they know they'd martyr a man? When they tore a hole into your sweet head They put another hole into my heart and bed A man of honor, though they'll never see You lived in tunnels for our victory You didn't build shelters for us to flee But you threw a stick at a drone for me Oh yeah, 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 yeah You fought with pride Through tunnels and fire You never died inside when others fell, you stood alone My love, my hero, my lion of stone Oh yeah, yeah, the Jews have confirmed our fears Your absence is even bigger than your ears In tunnels you whispered <laughs> for Palestine, my dove And now I'll keep walking our tunnel of love Anyway, beautiful song, right? It's called Tunnel of Love. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I wrote most of this, actually. I What I did initially was... Um, so what I did is I had kind of an idea for an outline for a song. So I told ChatGPT <laughs> to, to write a song that is uh darkly humorous and so on and then it wrote it and then i basically went over it and and started changing things vastly uh <laughs> chat gpt wouldn't come up with a stupid line like <laughs> like this one which is my line but and i'm laughing at my own joke here uh but then your ears yeah. in my lion of stone Oh yeah, yeah, the Jews have confirmed our fears Your absence is even bigger than your ears <laughs> That's a very stupid line I came up with that uh, <laughs> And yeah, and then I used a different I used Suno, which is an AI music creation system By first creating my own tune and then building on it and make and trying out 5,000 different versions until I arrived at this. This is what I do. Alhamdulillah. Powerful stuff. Powerful, powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Alhamdulillah. All right. Uh, the music, the background, epic. I know it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Chad GPD thought it was Palestinophobic. It was, it was, it was, alhamdulillah. Uh, I need to publish these things. I'm actually working on publishing this kind of stuff soon. Inshallah. Go top better than all my music, AP. <laughs> you just need to refine it over and 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 over again that's how it goes i also made a song for 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 gaza but i still need to work on that it's called i love gaza and it might sound like a little bit of a mockery but it's about how how beautiful and amazing gaza was before the war West Bank looks like Sinwar's ear, but <laughs> Michael, thanks to the night shift, I'm finally able to pay Jizya to the apostate prophet, to the prostate prophet. Alhamdulillah, thank you. I'm glad you said prostate prophet. Uh, faith refined by fire. 
made a super sticker. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Maybe I should use my my apostate profit tag and start raising money for prostate cancer or something. That would be fun. Wouldn't it be funny if I got prostate cancer as the apostate profit? It wouldn't be funny. Body Rabbit brought a sniper line. I know it's hilarious. It's, it's awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay. All right. I think I'm going to leave it at this and we'll probably be back tomorrow again and then on the weekends again. And um, we'll be back with David soon once he is back. And we'll also have a debate soon with David together against those uh, Ahmadi Muslims who want to debate something about Jesus' resurrection. Where I said, David, you can just do the debate. I'll just sleep during the debate. I'm fine with it. That's what we will do. That's what they do. Urinating upon one another. That's what they do. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. <clears throat> thanks, everybody, for watching. And see you again very soon. And as always, stay away from heroin. That's not the line. Man. What are you talking about? Uh, stay away from Islam.